Yeah, okay, okay, great. Right, okay. Okay, well, thank you everybody for, for being here. Um, sorry for the confusion at the beginning about the uh, virtual meeting room. And well, it's a little uh, past 12, well, past one in Madrid, so let's let's start. Um, we have done this, this work on, on wage inequality and, and poverty effects of lockdown and social distancing in Europe uh, with Juan Gabriel Rodriguez and, and Raquel Sebastián from ICAE and uh, Complutense University in Madrid. And the, um, the well, the, the motivation for, for doing this work is that uh, as many researchers, we, we were concerned about the, the, the potential effect that, that this pandemic and all the measures that governments have taken very rightly uh, in order to stop the pandemic may have not only in the macroeconomic uh, level, like of course there's, there's a projection that GDP will fall deeply in, in, in most countries, in all of the countries affected, but we wanted to shed some light on, on another dimension of, 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 this, uh, of this pandemic which is the, the potential effect that's going to have on inequality and poverty. Not all, not all workers are going to be equally affected. And, and we, we're, we're going to try it in a, in a very, uh, with a lot of assumptions and in a very stylized uh, way to, to, to kind of uh, diagnose what, what could be th those potential increases in inequality and poverty in Europe. Um, of course, if uh, I, I don't, I'm not sure how it works here. But if you do have a question that can't wait till the end, please feel free to interrupt and just talk. I, I would say <laughs> there's no other way. I'm gonna. I don't see any raised hands or anything here. So, but please feel free to to interrupt. Um, um, there's already there's a lot of papers coming out now on on COVID-19, as you as you as you all know very well, and there is a, 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 a strand of the of this new literature that, that focuses on these asymmetric effects that that the pandemic and the lockdown have on different type of work of workers. Um, this the, the famous the already famous paper by Dingle and Neyman, uh computed teleworking ability for occupations in in the U.S. and uh, and that kind of uh, gave gave uh, the possibility of, of using that 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 teleworking uh, measurement in other countries doing some, some adjustments that some that which is something that we have done in this paper there's more ambitious papers that try to 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 predict or forecast uh, in a more complex way the possible effect of of uh, both on demand and on supply uh, on on different industries, both on production and, and unemployment, like Del Rio, Chanona, et al. In, in 2020. There's some jobs that, that already take, take into account inequality at the local level. For example, this, this, there's a work that in, for Germany calculates that uh, the wage premium um, measured for teleworkable occupations, which which are likely to be less affected by the lockdown, and how lower um, uh, poorer poorer regions in Germany are more likely to have less teleworking, right? Which can which could increase uh, inequality, and and without considering teleworking, but focusing on the locked activities, Brunori et al find that that there is a a, dif a differential effect on the wage distribution on the income distribution that affects more poor people's poor workers in Italy and even even taking into account the measures that the Italian government is putting in place they still find a significant increase in inequality and poverty um, what we what we try to add to this is uh, to connect this uh, this different different teleworking ability that different occupations have 
and therefore they have been they're, they're going to be affected in a different way by the lockdown uh, with with data with microdata on wages for for workers in Europe and we will we that that will allow us to 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 see whether different productive structures and occupational uh, compositions in in countries in Europe lead to this uh, to different effects in inequality and and poverty so we will estimate for different scenarios we in the paper you will have different options of the about the length of the lockdown and additional partial closure of some activities in the de-escalation phase. But well, here in the presentation, there's those are like too many numbers and big tables. So I'll focus on just some examples of, of some um, simulation, simulated scenarios. And then, so we will do this for 29 European countries. And then we, we are able as well to decompose this estimated potential increase in inequality in Europe in the within country and the between country component. Um, of course, this this work has uh, many limitations. Like, for we and we have to be clear about that. We're we're going to consider only first order supply effects. So so how the labor market is potentially affected by this, and mm, we are not considering the the ulterior effect of on demand that 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 can deepen these differences we are considering only gross market income so so we are not considering taxation or all the different counteracting public policies like subsidies benefits follow schemes which of course it's uh, um, it's a good way on the other hand to compare uh, what the potential gap in in poverty and the change in inequality and and measure what is the need for this for these schemes and uh of course we are not considering other dimensions of of inequality of welfare inequality that have been that are going to be caused by this pandemic like uh health effects there's there's been studies that show that key workers are of course, more exposed to, to, to contagion and the mortality of COVID-19 is higher in, in the private areas in, in England as measured by the ONS. Um, we're, gonna, we're, we're going to assume common lockdown scenarios for, for all countries. Of course, that's, that's not what's happening in, in reality. We, we know that some countries have had longer and more stricter uh, lockdown scenarios than others, but as a benchmark, I think when and, and since we provide different lengths of the scenarios, one one can get an idea of of what is the potential effect uh, with these limitations in all countries. And then, even though the the data sources that we use are, are very rich, there is some limitations in the disaggregation of industries. We only have like one digit level. For occupations, we have two digit levels, which is a lot of occupations. And in since we are going since we are going to assign this teleworking index and the essentiality index, as you will see, to each of these occupations and industries, well, of course, it could be more fine, but I think we we can still do a, a reliable work in in the sense of picking which occupations and industries are affected in, in each of the scenarios. Um, so given this, this uh, important limitations, we still have some, some findings that we think hold. Um, we find that, that there is, there is a 2.2% in, in Gini in overall Europe when we consider a two month lockdown. If we additionally assume that, that there is a six month de-escalation period in which there is no lockdown, but some high risk activities like hospitality uh, can only work at 80% and then therefore workers in those activities will be 20% affected in terms of wage. That's the assumption. We, we see that the Gini goes up to 8.5%. Poverty 
increases as well, like 9.8 increase in, in the number of workers that fall, fall below the poverty line in overall Europe. And we, we do find different incidents across countries uh, with different occupational structures. And, but, but, but still, the, the within, and therefore that can make countries still fall apart from each other if the incidence is not the same in each country. And that, that does happen, but the main changes when we decompose inequality happen at the within country level. And um, so this, the sections that, that we're gonna have in this presentation, it, I'm, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the databases and how we, we measure teleworking and wages, how we build and, and, and translate that, that teleworking index into the European context, and then how we account for the essenti essentiality and the closure of, of some activities and get what we call the lockdown working ability index. And then finally, how we measure once, once we can, we can uh, see the, the, the potential impact on weight for workers with different lockdown working ability, how that would affect the poverty and inequality measures in the distribution at each country. And then, well, we'll present the results for that and uh, the summary and discussion. So the um, databases that we use, first of all, is these uh, ONET surveys that in the US that were used by Dingle and Neyman to, to match uh, the teleworking capacity of, of, of occupations at the six digit level in, in the US. Um, of course, the, the, that that classifications that they that they use is not the same as the one we we have in the European surveys. So we translate that, which is a somehow complicated because it's a many to many match in which you have to consider the relative weight of the occupations, and we obtain for each country and its occupation the the three digit teleworking index that we assign to each of those. Since we're going to use the wage from EU Silk before we need, and EU Silk has only two digit disaggregation for, for occupations, we have to translate that to collapse that into the two digit level. Again, using the occupational weight within of the three digit occupations within each two digit category. And then we, we plug that and we combine that teleworking index with the EU sale data that has micro data on wages and uh, other socioeconomic variables. Um, the, the wage measure that we're going to use, it's uh, the yearly gross wage for employees and self-employed, only for people who are working at the time of the survey, at least part-time, over 16 years old, and who report a yearly salary a positive salary in that year, and which includes cash salary and in-kind salary. So, well, this is a this is the teleworking index that we get for Europe uh, in this uh, intensity colored map, and we can see that mainly northern countries have a higher teleworking index. the The highest one is 0.48 in Denmark, which means that. 48% of the occupations can be done from home. Um, and then we get the overall average for Europe is 0.38, which is not far away from the one that Dinkle and Neyman find for the US, which is 37% of 0.37. Uh, Eastern Europe and, and Southern Europe countries have a lower teleworking index. So Spain has 0.33 and Romania is the lowest with 0.24. Um, if we have a descriptive look on how this average index in, 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 in Europe changes for, for different groups of workers, we find that female workers have, because they tend to be in occupations that, that have a higher teleworking index, um, they have a, a higher teleworking capacity, permanent workers more than temporary, full-time more than part-time and then there is a huge difference in all countries between low 
uh, workers with low education and workers with high education, which is uh, in, in, on average like 60% of the workers with higher education can telework. Um, if we look at the, I don't know if I can try this, let's see. <laughs> if we look at this map that, that uh, I don't know if we link that in the paper then, but we will, you can see that different, for example, if we go to the low education, we see that it all goes like very yellowish. So the teleworking index in all countries, maybe except, except for Norway is very low, like in Spain, it's 0 0.9, 0 0.09, which like less than 10% of, of people with low education can telework. Uh, whereas if you go for the higher educated ones it, uh, in Spain, it's like 0.53 and the highest I think it's Luxembourg with 0.71, like 71%. So that's one of the difference you can find in, uh, in this map. And uh, if, so the teleworking is clearly connected, correlated with, with the average salary in each country. Countries with a higher teleworking index have a higher uh, year salary. Um, also, it's negatively correlated with the uh, um, inequality of, of that teleworking index. So countries with less inequality in teleworking of their workers have higher wage and well that that prompts at, at, at the effect on inequality since since people with more teleworking are, are going to be more affected i mean less affected and they are the ones that have the higher wages it's it's the people with the lower wages and and less teleworking that it's going to be more affected and therefore inequality could increase because this applies also at the within country level like higher wage occupations have a higher uh, teleworking index. Uh, still, this is not exactly what we're going to check in this paper because we wanted to introduce, an, in a more realistic way, the essentiality of workers, which, which means that during the lockdown, there's some, some workers that are not restricted to work, even if they cannot telework. For example, health, healthcare workers, all workers related to the uh, agricultural sector or the food chain. Um, whereas on the other hand, we assume that workers in close activities like hospitality cannot work uh, at all during the lockdown time, um, regardless of their, tele their particular teleworking index. And, and only partially during the de-escalation period. That's gonna change the whole analysis then there's not so clear the connection with teleworking and we'll see that uh, that in, in a minute and we have well, for this classification of essential and close activities we have used the again trying to to make a comparable straightforward uh, simulation we have used the 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 laws or the decrees implemented by the Spanish and the Italian governments to, to pin those occupations and industries which, which are deemed essential or uh, closed. So with this, we, we, we can formally see what is this lockdown working ability index. So for each worker, we have the essentiality index, with, with, which is this, uh, E score from zero to one, uh, depending on the occupation and industry. The teleworking index, again, also from zero to one, and the closure score with, from zero to one, like one means totally closed. So then, uh, if, uh, if this worker is essential, then, um, the, the, and, and since essential is not zero or one, it can be like zero point something because of the aggregation that, that we have on at the occupation and industry level. So we assume that those workers can work to the share that they are essential 
and the non-essential part of that occupation can only work if they can telework. Um, <clears throat> if, if it's a closed occupation, then it can, and since closure is not always complete, it's not always one, it can only work during the lockdown if it's not closed, to the extent that it's not closed, and can telework. And then for the rest of the workers who are not essential or closed, uh, to any extent, it's just a teleworking index that applies because it's a lockdown. And uh, if you're not essential, you can only work if you telework. Um, so this is, once we have this index, then the connection between the salary for each country and the, and the average uh, lockdown working ability is not so clear. There is now a clear correlation. It depends on, of course, the share of workers in the essential and closed industries as well. And all, neither the genie of that lockdown working ability uh, seems to be strongly connected with, uh, with this, with the salary. And so, well, once we have that, then we assume that and of course, this is a, a simulated assumption of the potential wage loss in absence of, of uh, ERTE or for low scheme, any subsidy or, or just the companies keeping workers longer because there's a cost in firing and, and hiring workers. But the potential wage loss comes from the fact that some workers cannot work during the lockdown to some extent. So what we do is we, we compute this uh d d this d which is the length of the lo lockdown which can be in our simulations one two or four months and then that implies mm, a, a wage loss inverse i mean con opposite or anti-symmetric to the lockdown working ability so the more working ability you have the less wage loss that you're going to have which is this wage loss based on the pre-lockdown yearly, on the yearly salary. And uh, after that, we simulate an additional six months of partial closure in which if you're, if you're in one of those industries that is close to the same measure that you had before, which is this one, you also add this loss, which is, um, this is six over 12, because it's, we have this salary in, for, for a year, so six months over 12 months and point to which is the 20 percent closure that we impose which we think it's a very mild assumption and also from we'll see but there is there is some uh de-escalation measures now that say only 30 percent of the tables in restaurants and so on so we think point to is a like conservative uh, assumption for that so once we have that, we can have, before we get into the analysis of the inequality and poverty index, we can have a look at how, what is the, the incidence curve in terms of wage loss across the distribution uh, once we apply this, this index and, uh, and compute the wage loss in percentage. So there's some countries that uh, have a lower wage loss for the for the lower paid workers just romania stands out here most others sorry most others have this higher wage loss even in percentage in percentage points for the uh for the lower work for the lower salary workers at the bottom of the distribution and these other ones which have and this sort of an even of even shape this can give us a clue about the poverty and inequality measure, but then that, of course, it, it depends on what what was the previous distribution and and the shape of the of the wage distribution before the lockdown. But still, we can see that that, that countries that like Cyprus and, and Ireland that were these ones that had this uh, shape tend to have, in terms of of this poverty increase, which is what is the average percentage loss for workers below 60% of the median, that's which accounts in on average in Europe 
to 10%, and it's higher for these countries like Ireland and Cyprus and lowest for Romania, given, given that. Uh, and I have to admit, we, we, we have to extend this work and, 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 and we haven't done it yet to look more into what is the, the, the pattern in, this, in the industry composition that could drive this. Romania does have a lot of uh, primary sector workers which are considered essential and that can drive part of the, of the picture, but we, uh, that's an extension we, we, we think we should do. And uh, if we compute the mean wage loss, uh, which was the, the graph that you've just seen, for different, but that was for the two month lockdown, for different scenarios, and for, for average in Europe, this was the 10% for two months, and 5% for, for one month, 20% for four months. Of course, you can see that since the, 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 the parameter, the, the length of the lockdown increases, and uh, that applies linearly to the telework, to the lockdown working ability measure that we've computed, so that, that's a linear increase. And then once we add this closure, then it goes up. So in, in our most extreme scenario, the, the, the average, yes, someone wants to say something. Yeah, I have a question, Juan. Uh, yes. When you compare the two, four, six month scenarios, you take into account that, well, the losses for this kind of occupational, uh, the kind of each occupation are linear. I mean, it's not the same half a six month uh, lockdown in Spain, in which all the summer session in the tourism is lost with a two, a six, uh, with a two month uh, uh, lockdown in yeah. early spring. Oh, or right. I, yeah, we don't consider, okay. uh, I mean, it's linear within each country, but of course the, the rate at which it grows depends on the composition of, the, of each country's occupation. But it's true that we, we, don't, we don't take into account that this could, ha could happen during like, let's say the, the, the peak season in, in tourism, okay. and that could affect, as you, as you say, it could have a, a higher effect uh, and not linear. Definitely. No, in some I'm point. thinking on building in Northern Europe. I don't know whether in March it's uh, the big construction in our stop or growth or I don't know. It's just an idea. But uh, check that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we could check that. And and but yeah, that 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 would also need like different. In a way, we we wanted to make it comparable, and and we already have too many assumptions. And the more fine tuned you want to do, the more uh, things you have to estimate that we don't know about yet. But definitely, that different effect, depending on 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 what industries matter more during these actual months in each country, could be could be taken into account. Um, okay, thanks. Thank, thank you. you. And so, we, yeah, we see that, that the, the increase is, goes up. So on average, that could be 30% loss in wages for those workers in Europe. And that would range uh, from just Romania is this sort of outlier with 8%. But most of the other countries in this extreme four months lockdown plus six months of de-escalation uh, would range between 30 and 40% of wage loss for the poor workers. There is another poverty measure that we take into account, and that's the headcount index. That's how many workers uh, have a salary which is below 60% of the poverty line. And uh, well, this is the baseline, like, I, I don't know, let's say for Spain, 25%. After a lockdown of two months, that would be 31%, like an increase of 5%. 5% additional workers fall into the uh, into this poverty line as based on the poverty line before the lockdown, on the median before the lockdown. And then add in, and this is, I've just simplified and just have the two month lockdown plus, and the two lockdown, two month lockdown plus the six months closure that would increase in, in Spain to 40%, which is an increase of 13 percentage points. And then that would range 
from Croatia, 21%. And the lowest one would be Switzerland and Romania with 11 and 16%. I mean, um, well, this is not all the right. Denmark has the lowest one with 7%. And uh, then we move into the measurement of inequality. And uh, with, for inequality, we use the Gini index and, uh, and the mean logarithmic deviation, which, as you will see, provide different uh, scales of the effect, uh, since the, the mean logarithmic deviation is more sensitive to changes in the, in the lower tail of the distribution and therefore will yield a higher increase in inequality and also this measure will help us uh, decompose because of its properties the inequality in, in the within country component and the between country component for overall Europe. So this is the table for the Gini. Again <clears throat> only with a two-month and the two month plus six months closure, you can have a look at the other scenarios in, in, the, in the working paper. And then we see that for this two month, the, the inequality could increase, the Gini coefficient could increase between 2.2% and 4.9%. And, and uh, well, that doesn't seem too much, but the, the Gini index is very inertial. It's, 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 uh, it's not so sensitive to, to the tails, uh, to changes in the tails, but I mean, we, we still think this is a significant uh, change in, in Gini. And there is a paper that just came out, estimated the effect of, of past pandemics, the actual effect of past pandemics in, in inequality, and it's around 2%. Of course, that, we don't know if this pandemic, of course, the, this the, this is the lockdown it has had on the on the economy has been more severe than any other pandemic, and that would include include this second round supply and and demand effect. And we are here looking only at the first round supply potential effect, but but it's still significant. And if we add these six months of partial closure, that would make the Gini coefficient in, increase between ten and twenty percent in most countries um, as i said if we if we look into the mean logarithmic deviation that the, the increase is much higher is a much more uh, inequality averse index uh, and and it it, it yields a 12 percent increase in romania but the the highest one is a like a double the the the, the value of the mean logarithmic deviation in the Czech Republic. And uh, of course, this percentage increases all depend to some extent to the baseline inequality. Like we can see the, the, the change in absolute mean logarithmic deviation points is not the highest in, uh, in sorry, did I say Czechia? No, it's Slovakia. Excuse me for that. And uh, so it's 14 points in the mean logarithmic deviation which is lower than lower than Czechia and Croatia, but in percentage points, Slovakia has 117 because the baseline is the lowest one uh, in that case. So this also has to be taken into account whether we're measuring in a relative or, or absolute increase in the inequality index. And uh, finally, uh, the, the last uh, measure we compute is this decomposition between the inequality within country and between country component using the mean logarithmic deviation one can see that this that the total inequality in Europe that is if we compute wage inequality in Europe for the pool of the of the workers that amounts to adding up the between country component and the within country component like this is the average salary in each country weighted by the number of workers in each country so that wipes out within uh, country inequality and then the other the other uh, element of the of the equation would be the within component again weighted uh, by the size of the population in each country so if we do that for, and then this is for the 
the, the gene is just there as a reference because we're decomposing the mean logarithmic deviation. And that would be the baseline for Europe, like 0.42. And the between component, it's 0.12. And the within component, component it's 0.29, which is like 30% of inequality in Europe pre-lockdown is, is, uh, happens between countries and 70% is the inequality between countries. After a two-month lockdown, uh, inequality in Europe in, would increase with all this, uh, uh, computing these wage losses that, would, that we've done, we've obtained with the lockdown working ability index. And well, between inequality would increase like from 0.125 to 0.128, but the increase would be higher in the between inequality component. That's 24, 2.4% increase, 5.4% increase. And, and this is the share of the, that they compute in total inequality. And if we go to a more extreme case with adding to this two month lockdown, the partial closure for six months, then the increases from one from 0.12 to 0.13, a uh, five percent increase in between inequality in between countries inequality, but that's higher, much higher, 25 percent in the within uh, country inequality. So, so, but that doesn't mean there's no convergence. Like countries do fall apart from would fall apart from each other in this and the, in our simulations, but but people within each country would fall apart and at a greater distance in terms of wage. Um, so cohesion in, in Europe would be less, but within country cohesion and social uh, stability as a, well, side effect of, of the actual uh, inequality would increase even more. So just to summarize, uh, we have found uh, a 10 percent loss of wage for poor workers on average in Europe with the two month lockdown. If we consider the de-escalation period of a 20 percent closure on, on some activities, that would go up of, on a, to a 22 uh, percent wage loss for poor workers. We see that depending on the country between 2.6 and 86 percent of workers additionally fall below the poverty threshold just with this lockdown scenario and the and the potential effect on wages and that between 7 and 21 percent would do in a two month plus six uh, months of partial closure then if about inequality the gene increases between two and five percent and between 10 and 20 percent if we include this six months uh, of of uh, closure of activities, if using the M MLD, we see that that the changes are greater, and because of the properties of the index. But I mean, I think the bottom line is that regardless of the metric, uh, what we certainly find is that the effect, the potential effect on on wage, is an is an even, and it affects more the the poor people, I mean, the lower income, the lower wage workers than the other ones in all countries. Like we don't see, this is not an, an equalizing effect and certainly not pro-poor. The, the, the size of the, of, the, of the effect depends on the country. But I mean, of course, that's something that we all had an intuition that that was happening, that poverty and inequality would increase with the pandemic and the measures that have been, that has been necessary to take but we provide some, some measurement and, and diagnose of that in Europe. Um, so we find that the, the greater part of the changes occurs within countries, even though between countries inequality also increases. And we, and we, we, we can attribute this, the difference that we, differences that we find to the occupational structure of the, of the, of the different countries. And as I said, I think we, we need to, to investigate further what are the links of, of these patterns in the, of the difference among the different countries with the, with the structure that they have in industries and occupations. And uh, we think that this potential increase 
reinforces the importance of, of government action. This is all before or without taking into account these counteracting measures of the government. But I think it's a call or a reinforce, reinforcement of the need to take such actions to, to try to prevent this inequality uh, and poverty increases from happening, or at least uh, moderate that to, 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 to the greatest extent possible. And also, I think our findings could provide in the future a benchmark to see to what extent the actual disposable income inequality and, uh, and poverty differ, hopefully, and are much lower than the ones we find here. Um, and I think that's all. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, we have plenty of time for questions because you rang a lot. Okay, mm. normally we we are thinking on this uh, words of about for an hour or more. Okay, so we have plenty of questions, and I think that there would be more than one. Okay, okay. okay. Uh, I have one. Okay. Yes. I yeah. Uh, you focus on wage inequality. Okay. Yes. Yeah. That's the point. The the. No, I, I was wondering regarding the the implications, okay? Because we you are only focused on wage inequality but not on income inequality. And then if we really care about the inequality of income, the genie of not of wages, but uh, I don't know what uh, we of course when higher wages uh, are normally we think that are uh, in occupations that are uh, which for more educated and uh, uh, yeah. workers and with more capacity of teleworking, but uh, of course we are not. Uh, you focus on wage inequality. You are not taking into account the the losses of uh, firms or freelancers or self employees. Okay, and I think that that's going to make a big difference when we take into account the the uh, actions or government actions because yeah. the subsidies. You're right. You're right. The, the high income uh, freelancers are going to lose a lot when we incorporate the subsidies because they are going to declare uh, less less income, but so they will have right for lower subsidies, and they would be preferred to be working. Okay, yeah. whereas may, and they will pass for the reopen of the economy. Whereas a uh, lower income uh, workers will prefer to stay in the log down if they can get the, the subsidy because they don't want to work if yeah. just in order to get the minimum wage and get uh, the risk of getting the, the virus again. So I don't know, would you? Well, well I mean, this one wage thing. Is, is, okay, can I, I pick some questions and then I answer later or one by one? Or? No, one by one. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I mean, we do the thing. I don't know. Maybe I was not clear, but we we do take into account uh, freelancers or self-employed. Yeah. So it's not only employees for companies, but EU Silk also has the earnings that we call like wage in this case, even though it could be formally a different thing but we we also have self-employed because they do declare what is the their occupation in in what is their activity so we can have all these indices teleworking and and essentiality applied to them so they are considered in in the measurements of the potential wage inequality as well as for yeah whether in in practice is income what ma what matters you're, you're very right <laughs> That's the, uh, and that's the what that's what act, that's the actual welfare measure that that families have. But this, our intention was not to measure that, but to measure what is the potential loss, and in the labor market section only. Um, yeah, that of course that could be more complete if we had, I don't know, capital income changes, but but that is not so directly. I mean, it is because if a company. <laughs> Does not work. That's not yield profits either. But it's not so directly measured with and or I don't know formalized in the with the lockdown length and 
maybe. Okay, thanks. I think that there are some questions. They, uh, Carlos Diaz had two questions, so I think that he asked for the star. So, Carlos, open your mic, please. Carlos? I don't know, maybe I can read. I, I think it's Luis, Luis, no? Carlos is Luis. No. Creo que Carlos es Luis, sí. Luis? Mm -hmm. You could see this. Um. <laughs> okay. Carlos, open, Carlos Díaz, Luis, open your micro. But... Next in line, Diego Rodriguez, please open um, your mic. It's, okay. uh, it's, uh, oh. it's now okay? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so I, I have two questions. Uh, the first question, as most people know in this... Um, in this uh, seminar, my econometrics is very rough, but I think it would be very interesting to know not only the in the point estimators, but uh, the, the the confidence intervals, right? Yeah, um, that's something that we have pending. We should we should do that, and we're we're going to do that <laughs> for the for the main results at least. Yeah, because you know sometimes you say two percent, but two percent when you see the the confidence intervals is zero. You know? You're right. Um, it, it, we may find that some difference that we think are relevant yeah, between yeah, countries actually, and they are overlapping, no, and we we cannot not as relevant as, as you think and yeah, so on and so forth. Uh, the, the second question is uh, is about. Uh, maybe maybe I'm, I'm jumping ahead of you, but you said that uh, this kind of problem should uh, bring some kind of uh, public action. Do you have any idea of uh, what kind of public action would be better to, um, um, you know, to, to be a little bit more um, specific? More yeah. yeah, yeah, you're right. Um, well, I think um, since we know that um, that what we find is that po and perhaps the poverty measures are more to the point here, we find that poverty increases, which means that the lower part of the of the distribution is is losing, right? So I think that in a general way that could call for for the government to to focus on that people right of course it's it's okay and uh what measures exactly would apply to those i think we should as i said perhaps look more into the detailed pattern of what is the composition of those of those groups in terms of education gender or in which countries are more affected and why what industries are there so that could give a more like exact or precise profile of what is the people that should be targeted for this. But in general, I think that the main message would be that, well, inequality is going to increase and it's going to increase because the people at the bottom lose more than the people at the top. So I think it, governments can know which, which is the people at the bottom and, and how to, in general, address that, even though we could be more concrete in, in some in the analysis of, of who those people are you're right go ahead Diego okay uh, do you hear me yes yes okay thank you very much very interesting paper uh, I have two two questions one very specific about the the your local lockdown index. Mm -hmm. If if I understand, you distinguish between uh, close activities, essential yeah. activities, and the rest. No, yeah. and and in, in particularly, I, I understand close and the rest, but essential, uh, you yeah. say okay, I take the. Uh, 
the experience of Spain and Italy. I don't know Italy in particular, but in Spain, for example, essential really it was relevant for a very short period of time because it was in the in the two weeks with a very strict uh, um, close economic activities, but only for two weeks. Uh, so it's clear, for example, that energy, energy was essential in those two weeks. It, it, it was a very, uh, very strange because, as you know, even many firms didn't know if they were essential or they were yeah. not. Like the but mining, in case, the energy were, industry mining was complaining that, well, that they should have been in that list, you're right. Yeah, but principally in energy, if you are uh, the operator of the network, it was very clear. But uh, for example, you were uh, ma maintenance of uh, wind farms, it was not clear. So there were a lot of discussion there. But in any case, for it was for a two two weeks period, but very short time. So really, I don't un I don't understand why it's relevant that distinction uh, in a very in a in a longer period i mean two months four months six months i understand close i mean restaurants yeah so. i mean for the six months th th that is the essential part doesn't play it's just for the one two or four months ah, but, okay but it's it can be even i mean especially in the four months one as you say the essential restriction was not that long so we may want we may need to rethink that you're right okay uh, and I had a, a second question. It's about this uh, topic, you know, that uh, was mentioned previously about income and wages. Um, of course, uh, I understand that your work is about wages, not income. I understand that. But in any case, mm, uh, the interpretation of the results, uh, if, if I am right, is like if you had a maximum or some kind of cap. I say that in terms of the increase in, in inequality. And I say that because particularly this crisis, uh, all countries in this crisis are, are implementing a lot of measures in order to decrease or to mitigate the impact in terms of income. No, for example, or, uh, you know, the SURE program no, is pr precisely defined in order to support countries in Spain for ERTES and many other actually you know that a person that is in a ERTE is actually an employed people they are employed people not unemployed people no? so in that case i mean in particular in this context i i guess that your results in terms in terms of policy you know in terms of the increasing inequality are a little bit uh, well it's true in terms of your of your work, but I mean, it's like a maximum, or like a cap in that sense, no? Because there are a lot of policy measures in order yes, to get yes. the result. I don't know. I, that we tried, and uh, to be clear, that that in that point, you're that weird. I mean, I mean, it's a it's a maximum in the if we consider only the supply effect, right? That or in the long term, we don't know. Maybe demand will fall. And well, but that's a different story. We're talking just about the lockdown period. And, and you're right in that point. We, we per, I don't know, perhaps we should be more clear that this is potential extreme wage losses, assuming that if you are not teleworking mm -hmm. and your industry is not essential, you have zero wage. So that's a strong assumption. And that's why we like the gap that then governments, of course, with this ERTES and, and other schemes, they feel that. Um, and that the actual, probably the, the in, in, well, at least in, in developed countries that can afford to do that, which is the ones that we're dealing with here in, in Europe, in most cases, the actual increase will be lower than this in income. Uh, mm. But yeah, that, I think we perhaps, we should be more clear about that. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. We still have time for additional questions. Um, Lourdes had one question before, or I don't know. Oh, Rita? Uh, yeah, if that's okay. Yeah, so I was wondering, you're using the, um, the Dengel and Nainman, um score as a probability of working or not working. 
that's if, if I seem correct, that's that's how your shock works. I'm wondering if you've considered doing um, so using that score uh, and transforming it with a probability. So in, instead of taking it from zero to one, one could uh, fit logit or probability or sigma function uh, to take it as either binary or not, because working from home is tends to be not something that you do partially. It tends to be that you either can or cannot. Like if, yeah. if your company says you can work from home, you're still receiving your wage. You're right, but the thing is that uh, even though their index or the, the it's it's like binary zero one, the fact that we convert from the from those more disaggregated activities to three digit ones and then to two digit ones give us things that because because a two digit occupation is like a mix of different occupations that originally had the zero one index. Uh, we are unable to, to do zero one analysis and we, we just get like the weighted average for the big group of the teleworking, as you say, probability 0 0.7 or whatever. In any case, yeah, that's not real because it's not that, I mean, it could be, but in general, instead of having 70% of the workers that work and don't lose the salary and 30% that don't and lose the salary in our case well our we what we do is that we take from from all of them that have the same index 30% of the of the salary but i think it's i think it's not it's not wrong it's just uh, given the, the the structure of the occupations that we have I think it is still a valid and in on in the aggregate level it can be reasonable. Yeah. No, I, I actually think probabilities are better. I'm just uh, a bit in a way the way Danger and Neymar works is um, they have they pick 10 or so work activities from generalized work activities that are around 50. But what tends to happen is that if if you um, so that's like a score, but it should be amplified because basically if you can do 90%, you can do everything. If you can do 10%, you can't do nothing. So there should be like a nonlinear effect. Um, so I'm, 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 my comment is just, uh, or, or question is, um, if there's a way to, and I guess there will be further work to map that index in a nonlinear form that gives you a, a more uh, unequal distribution, which I think might be more realistic. Yeah, maybe. I think that would require us <laughs> to look directly to the questions again and and choose like, because I, I think perhaps that's something that you guys have done with your with your work. <laughs> but we we did not do that. We just used the we just did the merge into the original index that they have for their occupation using the questions that they use. But one option that we considered that perhaps it's, it could be more rich in that, in that sense is to look at the questions and see the descriptions of the activities that we have in our final survey and match and map the, the teleworking index ourselves from scratch, right? Yeah. Mm. But still, I don't, yeah, in a way, everyone at the same occupation will have to have the same one, right? Uh, Yes, unless um, you make, um, yeah. Because, yeah, I don't know. We can discuss this. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but it, it's great. It, it's really nice work to see. Thank you, Maria. Thanks. Okay. We still have time, some time for some questions. Any around? No? Okay. Oops. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Juan. Thank you. Uh, I think it was a very nice uh, seminar. Um, well, as every Wednesday, I will ask all open your mix and let's give a plug applause to the Thank you. Thank you. I close my mix. <laughs> No, I, I have to raise my Okay, thank you very much. Nice.
Okay. Okay. I'm sorry for the 